Hello, one today is Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. It is of the week in charts. I'm sure I thank all you guys and gals for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. I know I'm not the best at getting the links out, so I appreciate you finding the show. If you can't find the show, if you watch this on YouTube and you want to participate live, I would love to have you. DaveLander.com slash webinar, as I say each week. Register even if the leak is old. So what are you talking about? Well, current market conditions have a lot to say about that. Choppy, 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 choppy. To the questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. And this week we're going to focus on surviving a drawdown. Just some thoughts on that. I, I went through some old presentations and uh, I didn't realize how much I've covered this before and I've covered it quite a bit over the years. So I just kind of grabbed a few slides from that. And if you're interested in learning a lot more about that, and that's the, the part about trading that sucks, it's like, oh, I never want to talk about that. I wonder if I've ever talked about that. And I talk about it quite often uh, because you spend a lot of your time in a drawdown. Anyway, that'll make more sense in just one second. I do have an intraday trading update, and uh, it's not a good one. I'll tell you that right now. Kind of, a, as I'll say in a second, adding insult to injury, and I'll explain what happened there. And then a crypto update. Got a couple of um, free rolling cryptos and crypto market. I woke up this morning thinking it's it's uh, it's like 1999, and then it's like year 2000. <laughs> yeah, that was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. The reason I said 1999, 2000, it's like you wake up and you're doing fantastic. It feels like 1999, and then all of a sudden it all goes away and that's from one day to the next so it goes from 99 2000 back and forth again as it would say quite a bit i'm doing a little bit of an intraday trend trading experiment or at least making what i'm doing live or public I've, I've i've done some intraday trading on and off throughout the years as a general statement it's probably not a good thing to do it's kind of interesting that earlier today it's it's funny how you find things as you need them and I did find a couple of things I want to show you in a minute, but like I was reading, what is it, the art of thinking clearly, looking at my notes in there, and uh, they talk about how they did an experiment where they had people make decisions, and they were affected by the decisions as opposed to the people who did not make decisions. So his point, and it's my point often too, is that through all this decision making, it really takes its toll on you, really can uh, wipe you out. I think we're only wired for so many decisions, so I'm gonna have to be careful with this too. Anyway, so what I've been showing for those of you who are new to this segment I've been doing is I've been showing the S&P 500 vis-a-vis -vis the spider, so you get a true opening. And the point I've been trying to make is that on a trend day, this is all worthwhile, but on a choppy day, it is not. So I went back to where uh, we skipped last week because I was traveling. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just one second. And anyway, so I went back a couple of weeks. And on this day here, this was a Friday weekly option expiration. And somehow I managed to squeeze out nearly 400 bucks. And I actually had to go back in and look at the forensics on that to figure out how I did that. And I'll show you in just one second. But it was a choppy day. And the market went absolutely nowhere. Now, this day here, this is Tuesday. Unfortunately, I was working to get my way back home from Montana and I only was able to put on one trade. And I know hindsight's 2020, but it made me realize that you grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, and the market waits for no one. I'd be willing to bet I could have done fairly well on this day and it probably would have paid for a lot of the ugly days past and, uh, and then in the future a little bit too. Now, we got delayed in travel, so here I was trying to trade while I was traveling, got home, everything was pretty much flat for the day, but instead of just shutting things down, I let them run, and I ended up losing, as you can see, about 600 bucks. Next day was kind of all over the place, and I made a little on that day, I made a little on the downside, a little on the upside. Following day, gaps lower, and instead of a nice opening gap reversal, or even a gap and go, type of situation the market just chopped around and as you can see choppy day is the nemesis of a trend trader following day then we get a stupid gap higher <laughs> and then no follow through and then it sort of sells off and after all was said and done i lost eight bucks on the day made a few decisions got a little older got a few more gray hairs as you can see 
And was it worth it? Probably not. And then on this day here, another $573 loss or a $573 loss. And then on this choppy day here, this was, I guess, uh day before yesterday, was uh, minus 112. And today's trading is not uh, all calculated yet, but I'll show you that next week. Now, again, the reason I'm doing this is to see what can be done on a trend day, uh, what can be done to avoid a choppy day. And as I learn these things, I'll be happy to share them with you. But I did go in and see how in the hell I made money on that on that really choppy day back here where the market just kind of chopped around. And if you look at these four major pairs, and I know it's in hindsight, but if you watch them during the day, you get a pretty good idea too. Obviously, the two that should have been traded were Lab U and Gush, or its opposite drip in this particular case. So those actually had some decent moves. And when I zoomed in on the day, you could see the Lab U pretty much worked its way higher. And I went back in and looked at all the trades. And what I had done was I took a took a small position in options and then I rolled it out and was able to ride those options and exercise toward the end of the day and cashed out of the stock. And that's where the crux of the money was made. Now, on this gush or drip, and drip is what I have here, the darn thing had this really big gap open and then it just shot straight up, but then it went sideways for the rest of the day. And I actually, I actually ended up losing money on that one just because there was no follow through from that opening range. So this is what the intraday profits look like. And you can see it was pretty promising for a while, pretty much went straight up for a while. And if we go in and look at those market conditions, or if you rewind the week of charts a few weeks, you can see that there were some really nice trend days in there. And then the market really, really, really got choppy. And you can see it's been one hell of a drawdown ever since. And of course, again, not to pour salt in my own wounds, but I, I think that one big day in there, uh, what was that, last Tuesday, could have been a pretty good day for me in doing this. And that's another another one of the issues is you must be present to win. And, and that, that goes for trend trading too, but with the trend trades, you know what your trade is going to be ahead of time. You can put it on and then go about your life. And I'm not a really good phone trader. I know some clients that, um, I know one guy could scalp off his phone. It's like playing video games, you know, and, and I'm just not that good. I haven't used it enough. I don't get out enough. That's the other, another problem too. I probably need to get out a little more and uh, you know, COVID put the brakes on that. Plus I never leave the office anyway. Usually my travel is always business related. Is it worth it? I'm not gonna beat the dead horse too much on this because I've kind of talked about them quite a bit, but if I let the market come to me, yeah. If I wait for that, that trend day to develop, and I've talked about this before, like the Holy Grail day hunting, where you look for the percent range move to be outside a certain range and 50% of the range compared to the 10 average true range, the 10 day average true range. So that means that the market is on the cusp possibly of making a wide range bar. That will keep you out of a lot of chop. If you don't go into an ETF until it's at least 50% or more in the movement, and in the VIX trading that I did a while back, which I haven't done a whole lot of lately, that was one of my little little filters, whipsaw filter, so to speak, was waiting for that VIX to have more than a 50% expansion in range. And believe me, as as this hopefully works out, which you know right now that it's it's becoming a little questionable, but if it does work out, I'll be happy to share all this with you. And a lot of it I've already shared with you in the past definitely a lot of mental and physical stress like i said i've got um new and inventive things going on in my upper back which i haven't had since i had a day job <laughs> which is uh which is kind of uh kind of ironic you know it's like i wanted to get away from a day job so i so i could have a nice relaxing career in trading but uh that's uh that's kind of interesting uh you can put yourself in a serious state of regret it's like oh Maybe I better get out of this market. It's not moving. And then all of a sudden it takes off without you. Then you jump in as it's taken off without you. You can chase your own tail. A lot of these things I've been talking about quite a bit. Um, I was doing really well and I stepped on the gas. And that's why that drawdown got so big. 
at least initially it was because I started leveraging up thinking that I'm better than I am <laughs> thinking I'm God. It, it just, you got to realize that sometimes the market conditions are what, what's really kind of pushing you along, especially as a trend follower. Um, as of it say quite a bit, saying yes to something, saying no to something else. So it's like some of my research is not getting done. Some of my client follow-up is not getting done. Somebody uh, emailed me a, about a week ago for something and I haven't even gotten around to emailing them back just yet. They probably think this guy doesn't, doesn't give a shit, but I do, I really do. Uh, there's a potential to chase your own tail and end up in a negative spiral, obviously. Uh, you know, one thing that, that has come out of it, which has been really cool, is that I've been able to go through, I said I'm going to talk a lot about all stuff, and, I, and here I am. But one thing that had, has come out of it is uh, tape reading, as I, I'm going to talk about in one minute, which is a skill that, that should help me for the rest of my life. But it has been a lot of fractal learning, as one of you guys calls it where your each day is like a complete lesson in and of itself. And I, I have been doing some writing and I'm working on a book, which because I'm doing a trading, I know it's ironic because of the trading, I don't have enough time to work on the book. But I'm also, it's also reminding me of these big longer term cycles that are happening with my position trading. And that's been kind of a cool thing. And the psychological ups and downs have been kind of cool, not the downs, of course, but kind of reminds me of things. And that's got me digging out stuff. Um, like the art of thinking clearly to talk about to so I could brush up on what happens when you make decisions and and so on and so forth. Tape reading again is is has worked out pretty cool. And then, you know, again, less would be more. My ultimate goal with all this intraday trend trading is to put on my put on the trades and then get up get on with my life. And as I've said before, I used to put on like an ogre trade, nobody got reversal trade. And even a lot of this ETF stuff, and then go off, you know, get on my bike, go ride around or whatever, ride 20 miles, and then come back to work. And I haven't had time to do those things lately. Now, one reason that I am doing some of this uh, more active trading that I have been doing too is because now I'm doing two shows every week. I, I'm doing this show, obviously, and then I'm doing the stock chart show. And the stock chart show, takes a lot of my time. It's it's more of a kind of a, a focused type of show and it's got to fit in a certain slot within a certain time frame, and it's got to be edited and all this other good stuff. Whereas this is kind of open-ended and this is just me talking to you about what I want to talk about this week. So this show, it, it, it doesn't take as long to prepare for as the other one, but having to do two shows in one week and stuff that I wanted to talk about here, but I've already talked about there, it's just, it's, it's a lot going on. Two shows is a lot. As I've said before. Anyway, one thing I added this week is there is a potential insult to injury issue. It's fantastic when the intraday stuff is doing really well in, in other type of trading. And that kind of smooths out the equity curve with the position trading because there's going to be a lot of drawdowns in that longer term trend following, the swing to intermediate term trend following. But when you're losing money on both, and especially like add in crypto, then it, it does kind of weigh on you quite a bit. So there's the insult to injury issue. So I don't want to make it look easy. And obviously, this drawdown shows you that it's not. Not that I wanted to draw it out to make my point. And one thing that I found uh, while looking for some slides tonight on drawdowns was one from Peter Brandt. And this reminds me a while back where I got involved with a lot of this hyperactivity type of trading and hit a drawdown. And Peter Brandt had said that he was doing some trading that was outside of his his wheelhouse, so to speak. I forget exactly how he worded it. But then he came to the realization that if he's going down, he's going to go down knowing how. If I'm going down, I'm going down with what I know how to do. So when you're in a drawdown with your core methodology, and then you're experimenting with this other stuff, you've got to be careful not to let that drag you down. And if you're going to go down, it's okay to, to follow your core methodology and have that drawdown and lift that drawdown. That's what I'm focusing on tonight. And then I have focused on quite a bit in prior presentations. But just be careful you're not playing somebody else's game in the meantime. Anyway, just a couple of slides I grabbed from a while back. I don't want to reinvent the wheel because I have done multiple presentations on this. If you go to my website, davelander.com and search drawdowns, 
you'll have enough stuff to keep you busy for a long time. So surviving a drawdown, the one thing to remember is you're pretty much always in a drawdown, even when things are going well. And as I've said quite a bit, and I forget who said it first, but as a trend follower, you're going to spend a lot of your time less wealthy. Also, the only way to make money is to be a trend follower and to capture a trend. So it sort of comes with the territory. I've I think I've talked about these things throughout the years over the last 20 years about the the downside of trend following, even though it's the only way to make money, right? And I probably need to compile it all into one place. And that's what I'm doing pretty much part of that with the book, with the psychology section, which is huge, huge, is talk about how how hard it is sometimes to be a trend follower and how hard it is almost all of the time. And Robert Frey, I don't know if he's still running money, but he used to run a, a nest ton of money. And uh, one of my clients sent me a video of his on YouTube. You can probably Google him on YouTube and find it. And one of the things he said interesting is you spend 75% of the time in a state of regret. And that's because the market, no matter what the market is, even good markets spend a lot of time backing and filling. And my friend Greg Morris said markets only make new highs about 4% of the time. Now, I found this slide, if I can get to it. Oh, before we get to that, there's really two questions you have to ask yourself. What's changed in the markets? And the answer to that right now is, we've become incredibly choppy. It's like this market was trying to come out of this bear market. We had a thwarted signal. If you go to my website on the homepage, I show the, uh, the how the TFM 10% system was close to a buy. It was actually a buy in tra in tra week, in tra week, but not week over week. And it's a weekly based signal. And that'll make sense if you go in and watch that Trading Simplified presentation, which is on my, on my homepage. But you need to ask yourself, what's changed in the markets? A while back, I did a presentation on drawdowns, and I showed how the volatility just imploded. And that was, uh, I think that was coming out of the pandemic, if, if memory serves. And I had a friend of mine who does a lot of this really hyperactivity, hyperactive type of trading, and he couldn't figure out what was wrong. Like, what's wrong with me? It's like, well, Come to find out, the, the volatility absolutely imploded. And one of the stocks that he was scalping, Boeing, the volatility absolutely imploding and, and the spreads began to widen and he no longer had the edge that he had before. Now, the other question you have to ask is what's changed in you, okay? Has, do you have an injury or illness? Has, is someone close to you have an injury or illness? And sometimes it doesn't have to be a really big deal. And I think I've said this a few times before, but one time my wife sprained a foot and she wasn't able to exercise. And don't worry, she doesn't watch these presentations, nor do I think she can hear me in here. <laughs> but it kind of made a crotchety and that kind of rubbed off on me. I know I shouldn't blame others, but you need to find out or ask yourself, has anything changed in your life? Now, I, I, I do believe in fate. I, I think that. A lot of times when I'm searching or not even know I'm searching, things just begin to pop up. I'll find a book that was long lost in my office and I'll just flip it open and there'll be like an underlying passage or something like that. So I really believe in that stuff. I kind of vacillate back and forth between the, the esoteric and like, come on, Dave, get real. But I think there's definitely something there. There's like an outside force or something. And I think if you open yourself up to it, it'll it'll make itself available. I'm not trying to get too crazy on you or anything, but a few things that just a book I found today by accident, like I said, it's got some really great underlying passages, and I'll talk more about that over the next coming weeks. And that's that was the art of thinking clearly. But anyway, and looking for slides for my Trading Simplified show, I came across this slide right here. And I'm like, holy crap, look at this portfolio. And it made me realize why I do what I do. And if you look at the current portfolio, it's it's in the red and it's negative. And then just tonight, I 
was looking for some of these drawdown slides and I found the, the, some of the slides I just showed you. And then two weeks later, I was like, oh, here's another presentation two weeks later on it. And the presentation was coming out of a drawdown. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And that's another one of those things that, that I needed to kind of rehear myself. So the point I'm trying to make is I'm not immune to all this. I mean, I've been in a shitty mood lately. <laughs> you know, make no, bone, make no bones about it. And drawdowns are tough and drawdowns suck, believe me. All right, any thoughts or questions on drawdowns? Now, one thing that I, I did want to mention before I shift gears is that provided you're, you're doing your own game, playing your own game, provided that you're following whatever your core methodology is, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, you've got to keep following it. It doesn't mean that you can't get selective, like because if that if that's what the market's telling you to do. So right now my database is only producing a handful of stocks. And out of that handful of stocks, maybe there's one, if that many, that I think are worthwhile. And then in one of the older presentations that I stumbled across earlier, and it was right around one of these drawdown times, I said that in a presentation, I went 50 days from setup trigger to the next setup trigger. So that's two and a half months. I'm not doing anything with the core methodology. And I, I guess I'm I'm kind of proud of that. It's like, okay, well, I recognize that conditions were choppy and the market has gone sideways. And, and we can look at that too in a few minutes. And one thing I, I, I kind of dig doing is, is uh, and I know I'm a nerd, but I like watching what's going on in the Facebook group and it's, it, it seems like some of you guys are trying to make something happen that's not actually there. You're showing some stocks where the net-net price change is relatively unchanged for a month or so. And it's like you're trying, you just you just want to set up really bad. And I, badly, I know one of you guys was I had taken a break from trading and now you're coming back and you're gung-ho and ready to go. But now's the time to continue to probably just sit on your hands and let things shake out and let that market come to you. And, and you know, that that that's one big lesson I'm, I'm learning and relearning too with the intraday stuff is, if I let the market come to me, I absolutely print money. As I've said a thousand times, this buddy of mine, we do a little trading together here and there. And sometimes we won't talk for a while, we'll both get busy or whatever. But if the market is in a route, meaning that's just going one way, he'll text me, he goes, you crushed it, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, I did, you know? So if I could just wait for those days, I think I could really do well with that stuff and i'll be happy to share again anything i learned from that and and part of that stuff as i said earlier was like the holy grail day hunting and if you go on my youtube channel youtube.com slash c slash dave landry or just search for at dave landry once you're on youtube you'll see some of that holy grail day hunting and i have that in the quick clips too so you don't have to sit through an entire hour and a half of a week of charts anyway now with the crypto, one thing that's really cool with the crypto, and this goes for any other market out there that, that, that would happen to arise. And as I would say quite a bit, it's not about the crypto. But what's cool about the crypto is trading is trading. And as I've said before, us little bit older guys, I guess a lot of bit older now for me, <laughs> and some of you guys have grown, grown old with me one of you guys updated your picture the other day and you age 40 years i'm like good lord <laughs> it made me realize how we're all getting so much older but i think as older guys who've been around a while have an unfair advantage because i think the cryptos is uh has really sucked in the younger crowd and i think us older guys if we're patient and we use money management and all the other stuff i think we could do quite well in this market but you have to really really be patient and if everything begins to die out again and you're not coming in and markets are up 50 and 60%, 100% overnight, and they're just going lower and lower, and then almost everything's below the 30 EMA, then just sit on your hands. And that's another thing that that we have the ability to, to do too, is to just sit on our hands when that occurs. But knowing trends and knowing money management and knowing bubbles, okay? And sometimes, as I often preach, you could just buy the ones that are going straight up, with a heavy dose of body management. So knowing all these things gives us a bit of an unfair advantage. If you don't know all these things, you can learn them. And that's the that's the beauty 
of trading. Um, I wrote recently that the the process of trading successfully really isn't that hard. It's not exactly easy, but it's really not that hard. Following the process is. Anyway, the, the trend following more on stuff in crypto. So here you can see this market has taken off nicely. Neo, you guys know what they do? Because I have no idea. <laughs> Anyway, it's probably better that you don't, right? Yeah, it might all be BS, but who cares, right? If you can make money off a bubble, then make money. And a lot of people poo-poo crypto. Well, these people who poo-poo crypto probably wouldn't know a trade if it bit them in the ass. Well, if you're poo-pooing and you're that, if you're that adamant about it, then by all means, short them, okay? Anyway, nice little pullback. Uh, entry was fairly aggressive. With crypto, when the market is blowing and going, it's kind of, again, like 1999, I, I've been a little bit aggressive in my entries as opposed to waiting for, let's say, waiting for, let's uh 13 or maybe even higher. That If this was a stock pulling back, I didn't earn a little bit higher, but I've been a little bit more aggressive with my entries. Stop down there. I had a little bit of an IPT up here. And I forget if this was leveraged or not for the for the non-leveraged crypto trading that I'm doing. I'm looking for a 20% profit target. And for the leveraged, I'm only looking for 10%. And if I get that 10%, then I'm going to let that stop wide now. Now, I know 10% is really tight, but sometimes these things can blow through 10% and keep on going. Just start stop out of a trade, see? <laughs> Damn it. Anyway, but you can see that uh, got in, didn't buy a whole lot, got in at, where did I get in? 1185, flipped out half at... 1304 and now i'm free rolling on this and my ultimate goal is to establish a lot of these three free roll positions and i think i've got four or five right now on no actually i have three that are free rolling now i was up to like 10 or 12 last week when everything was going kind of crazy and now i only have a couple and with the free roll the worst you could do is less something absolutely catastrophic happens but the worst you could do is break even on the remainder of the position so let's just use round numbers let's say you get in something at 12 flip it out at 14 you bump your stop up to 12 and then if it retraces back at least you made a little bit of money by exiting half your shares and if it really takes off then you have the chance for a home run and by the way that's something i haven't fully figured out just yet it's something i'm working on but i had one that went up two, three, or four hundred percent over a very short period of time. And I, I scaled out a little bit, even past the one half. But I guess a part of me and a part of my ego was thinking like, okay, let's just ride this puppy because it's a free position anyway and see how much we could squeeze out of it. And in hindsight, I probably should have peeled back a little bit more off of it. So I'm working on that. That's a good problem to have. And, and lately that hasn't happened a lot. It's, it's so funny. Uh, I wish I had the slide, but it was, uh, I guess it's from Interstellar. I've never seen the movie, but Elon Musk or somebody posted it. And it says one day here is like two years or five years or 10 years on earth. And it's kind of like they had wrote crypto underneath it. And that's kind of how it is. Like I said, we're going from 1999 to 2000 and then back again. So it's like you're you're not getting these longer term runs like you did in 1999, for months on end where you just couldn't wait to wake up, see how much money you made. Now it's kind of like you wake up and you're like, is it 1999 or is it like two, March of 2000? Anyway, so free rolling on that one. And, and again, just simplified, simple trend following stuff, recognize a trend, find a pullback. And again, my entries are a little bit aggressive. And I, I showed a stop down here. I probably in reality had it a little bit closer to the market. And I'll actually go in and, and shut down things that really aren't working because it really should move in your favor fairly quickly. Now, as this market matures a little bit, then maybe you're going to have to back off a little bit on being aggressive and then go back to those wider stops like we'd use in, in stocks. But right now, this market is so inefficient, it can make those 50 and even 100% moves overnight. In fact, Sometimes I'll be putting on positions, and while I'm putting on my positions, I'm actually already taking them off. I'll, I'll have profit targets being hit. Not so much lately, but last week, which was, what, 10 years ago in crypto talk, a lot of that was happening. Anyway, so 
Additional profit target, fairly tight on this one. I think this was a leverage position. I'm pretty sure it is. I could double check that. But you can see, uh, I'm not putting a whole lot in these things. Don't bet the farm. You know, what I'm doing is I'm kind of making it a game and I'm trying to parlay a little account and see how big I can make it. Um, you know, like I said a while back, I don't want to be like the Judas goat. The Judas goat is a little goat. They put the bell around and all the other goats follow it. It a lead the Judas goat through the through the slaughterhouse and out the other side and, and all his little goat brethren get uh, slaughtered. So I don't want to be the, the Judas goat. So I'm not trying to say this is the greatest thing in the world because sometimes it's not. But I do want to show that trading is trading, trend following is trend following, money managers, money management, and psychology is psychology. Trading psychology is trading psychology. Anyway, so you can see it hit the IPT, exited half, got to stop to break even, and I'm free rolling on this one too. So like I said, I have three I'm free rolling on and that's it. And it's been as many as maybe 10 or 12 recently, but it seems like I haven't been able to hold on to any for, for that long a period of time. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears. Let's, uh, we'll take a look at some crypto. And then if you guys, um, you guys have any crypto you want to talk about? I'll be happy to to bring it up, and then we could do um, individual stocks here in just a second. All right, let's go over to the crypto. Let's see. Here we go. So let's take a look at at Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was just recently taken off, and then it stalled out a little bit. Now, as I said quite a bit, and I I don't have a chart for you tonight, but I've shown it many times before, where you have Bitcoin and you have like a stock overlay. And that's a bit of a bummer, as I've been saying quite a bit, is that my hopes were that crypto, especially Bitcoin, would trade separately from stocks but it's it's all risk on risk off and when stocks are chopping around a little bit or headed lower so is bitcoin and that's one thing that's unfortunate and uh, as i've said quite a bit when i was in the bull bear debate i was a bear and that was last year sometime around november or whatever oh way back here i was a bear back here and you know, it imploded and Greg Snell, he took the bull roll. He didn't care. He's like, okay, I'll be a bull if you want me to. And he took the bull stance, and but he had a caveat. I didn't know we were allowed caveats. And his caveat was that the S&P 500 had to improve before his bullish thing would kick in on Bitcoin. But they are highly correlated, unfortunately. But Bitcoin obviously has improved quite a bit. We're down around 15,000, and now we're at 20-something thousand. So that's a pretty good move. And if you're a trader, you don't care. You're not going to poo-poo it. Yeah, it might all be BS, but who knows? By the way, I think I am a bull on Bitcoin in general um, with the caveat that all asset classes will lose half of their value at some point in your lifetime. And I've seen crypto lose many halves. And you can see, obviously, 60,000 or 70,000 all the way down to 16,000. That's about, what, 60 or 70%. Of its value, but you know it also it also went from twenty five cents to seventy thousand dollars. So that's two sides of that. But if you're a trader, you should be able to trade and catch the upswings, and if you're real aggressive, maybe catch a few downswings along the way. I'm not a huge fan of shorting crypto just because it's so damn crazy. It can go so far against you so fast, and it can be choppy on the short side. But I'm not afraid to short any market. Okay. So here's a couple of free rolls. I think here's the two I just talked about. There's NEO and there's CFX. And you can see neither one are really setting the world on fire. And like I said, I had like six or eight of these. And again, as I've said quite a bit, and the, they just swapped over. So it's this is, is going to be a great way to show you. But sometimes you can just go in and look at the relative strength. And I think I said this earlier, just don't buy anything below the 30 EMA. And that in and of itself could keep you out of a lot of trouble. 
Here's one I have in blue. You can see it's, it's pulled back in here. It's kind of interesting looking. The long tail suggests that it could be thin, so you'd have to be careful with that one. Then we go over to the cash market here. And any pairs you guys want to look at, I'll be happy to pull them up. Let's see what's happening in cash. See, this one's up 40-something percent. Oh, that's against Bitcoin. So I usually don't trade those pairs at this point in time. So look, you can see this thing really took off. I don't know how liquid it is. Looks like it's taken off now. But there are a lot of tradable moves, especially in the ones that, that tend to have a little bit more volume. Let me see if we can find something interesting. Yeah, let me know if there's something you want me to look at. I'd be happy to do it. I guess we should uh, look at the obligatory Ethereum. We just looked at Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum kind of looks like Bitcoin. Not a whole lot to get excited about. Net net price movement, pretty flat in here, as you can see. So not a whole lot to get excited about there. Uh, ideally, you want to see it break out of this range before looking to go after it. I would not position trade there, but I would take a look at some of these other shiz coins in here that are taken off and see if there's anything worthwhile. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears and uh, going once, going twice on crypto. Let's go ahead and get the stocks, and then we'll uh, I'll take a look at the uh, you could punch in your stock picks if you want one uh, ticker at a time if you don't mind just for your benefit so I could see what I've covered and what I have it. Okay, let me get my stocks. Okay, yeah, I like that one, Jeff. Already, I like I like where you're going with that, but there's not a whole lot I like. I mean, I'm going to be a little bit like Mikey and hating everything, so don't think I'm a hater. Now, one thing I've been doing a little bit lately is I've been looking at the bow ties, and bow tie proper order meaning 10 greater than 20 and 20 greater than 30 for uptrends. And 10 less than 20, less than 30, and 20 less than 30, I should say, for downtrends, can keep you out of trouble. And it can help, I should say, to keep you on the right side of the market. Let me just show you what bow tie moving at, what the proper order looks like. And we'll go ahead and let me just shift gears here. We'll show you this real quick. Uh, let's see, spy. Okay. So here's the here's the spy. And this is the daily. We can take a look at the um, SPX. And then we'll put it in proper order. So proper order just means that it's just a kind of a cool way to look at trends. So, so is Landry Light too. Right here is Landry Light. This just means that the lows are greater than the moving average or the highs are less than the moving average. And as you can see, it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And this works in multiple time frames, as I said before. If you take a look at like a weekly chart, oh, this is not showing up like I wanted to. This is a weekly chart, and this is the Landry light. And when it's red, you want to be short or out of the market. And when it's green, you want to be mostly in the market. But one thing that's kind of cool too, and again, it works on all time frames, is the proper order. And if we click on proper order, when it's yellow, it means the both time moving averages are meandering back and forth. When it's red, it means they're in downtrend proper order. And when it's green, it means they're in uptrend proper order. And you can see now we're in the process of switching from green back to red. It's yellow because it's in between. So just want to show you that real quick. I know everybody here is probably familiar with proper order, but we do have some new guys and girls coming along that have recently asked me a lot of questions about it. So let me shift back to my other charts. So anyway, you can see S&P 500 on the cusp of rolling back over. Nice little outside day today. I, I sure would like to see it continue to bounce from this oversold situation. Longer term, as I've been saying, a nausea, it does look like a process type of bottom. It Sometimes it just takes a while for a market to bottom out, and that's fine. Ideally, though, we want to see it start working its way higher, so we'll be able to catch some trends along the way and have more of like a rolling a uh, bull market happen, like maybe the semis take off for a while, then maybe biotech take off for a while, and the overall market just kind of gradually works its way higher, as opposed to this event where 
the market goes straight out. We catch two or three or four stocks, whatever the case may be, get some nice trends out, but then that's it. So I would much rather something more gradual in nature. And then that's where we could do our jobs by digging through the database and finding the, the next big thing. And, you know, right now it sure seemed like AI was going to be the next big thing. Maybe it won't. I've already seen memes out there making fun of it. So we'll see. But usually that's a good sign. When you see the memes making fun of something, it's it's usually a good sign that whatever that something is, is going to take off. But anyway, S&P 500 kind of rolling back over here. A bit of a bummer. They kind of broke out past this prior peak. Now they're coming back in a little bit. So watch your proper order and also pay attention to the Landry light on that. Let's take a look at bonds while we're down here. Bonds were beginning to bottom out and rates were dropping because bonds were bottoming. But unfortunately, bonds have rolled back over and you can see we're in downtrend proper order once again. Nothing magical about that, but it can and can be in a keyword in that sentence help to keep you on the right side of the market. We'll take a look at the dollar too. The dollar is now in uptrend proper order. It's not the, it's, it, I wouldn't rush out and buy the dollar. Maybe longer term, it's just kind of pulling back. As you can see, we'll take a look at a weekly. You can see it hasn't completely turned on the weekly. It kind of has a, a bigger picture top look to it still. Unfortunately, stronger dollar seems to be bad for stocks. And I meant to grab the chart earlier, but I ran out of time. But I, I will do an overlay chart for you when I get a chance. And you could you could actually do it yourself. You could just overlay the dollar behind the S&P 500 and notice that they have a pretty good negative correlation. Now, that doesn't always happen. Years ago, I worked for a hedge fund or consulted with a hedge fund, I should say. And we discovered early on in my process, I was there for about 14 years, but early in my job, I would keep an eye on this intermarket technical analysis stuff. And it almost always, it almost always worked together, which was pretty cool. So you could always figure out the inverse relationships or the or the correlated relationships and predict one market off the other. But then we discovered that it only mattered when it mattered. The markets had a bit of a, a fundamental shift or whatever. So they do kind of go both ways. Okay, Craig's asking for a 2 day moving average. So let's let's do this. He said on the spy chart, let's switch over here and let's take a look at the 200 day moving average. And then let's go ahead and do, let's put Landry light in there with it. So let me just see if I could paint that in real quick. We want Landry light. We'll do this. Let's see what this looks like. We'll go dark. All right, so that's Landry Light with the with the 30. Let's change this to a, well, let's get rid of that, I guess. Let's put a 200 in there. Well, we could do both. Let's see, let's do, let's get rid of that. And then let's add in a simple moving average. We'll go 200, okay? And we'll make it nice and thick. And then while we're at it, let's change color so it doesn't conflict with the price bars. Okay, so we got a nice longer term 280 simple moving average. Let's change this down here to 200. And notice that it has EMA here. We're gonna change that to simple. I've, I've gotten quite a few questions from people saying, hey Dave, my charts never look like yours. And we figured out that he was using a simple versus exponential or vice versa. I think it was it was exponential versus simple, but anyway. Okay, so you could see just real quick and then we'll get to Craig's uh, point. You could see that paying attention to the Landry light with the 200 day moving average can, and can be the keyword in that sentence, keep you on the right side of the market. The other thing you wanna watch though is when you start vacillating back and forth between red and green, like you see back here, that might be a good time to sit on your hands. And right now we've gone, as you can see, from red to green. One thing I wanted to mention earlier that I didn't, but the net net price change, we're right around 4,000. Where were we way back in November? Right around 4,000, okay? So we got November, 
December, January, February. So we got four months where we haven't made any forward price movement. Yeah, we had some gyrations in there, but we're going sideways for four months. And and as I've said a thousand times before, but it was kind of a wake up call for me back when I was trading the big contract in the S&P futures. I did really well for a while and then all of a sudden began to underperform. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you're a trader, you know, you think you got it all figured out. And I was pouring my heart out to an attendee and he's kind of a jerk, but I needed that jerk at that point in time, you know, <laughs> kind of those things that higher force kind of appearing when you need it. He's like, have you applied the S&P lately? And I'm like, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And he goes, have you looked at the ADX? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he goes, it's like 10 or 13 or whatever. And it, it really woke me up and not that I use ADX that much, but the net net price movement for the period he was talking about was pretty much nil. And you can see here, again, we're at 4,000 way back in November. And then we're right around 4,000 now, okay? All right, so Craig says, you know, nothing good happens below the 200. Yeah, that's uh, Baleo and, uh, good point, Baleo and Guyard. Uh, and I've, I've talked about them quite a bit. I need to find their, the piece they wrote. They wrote some article or some dissertation or something, and it's like where bad things happen. And yeah, bad things tend to happen below the 200-day moving average. And that's where the Landry Light can can come in handy but craig is right and thanks for bringing that up so it's like okay it, it on the flip side good things can happen okay look you're above the 200 you got upside landry light that's a pretty good run there some bad stuff began to happen here 2015 2016 you go back to those two years and trading was hard back then because i remember the market chopping back and forth back and forth back and forth it was brutal for the trend follower but just paying attention to things like whether or not you're above or below the the 200 day moving average can keep you out of trouble now george wants to take a look at a weekly chart let's do that real quick and then we'll see what other points craig wants to make always get something good out of craig thank you craig craig's been with me forever through thick and thin right now it's thin thank you craig <laughs> okay the weekly chart it's kind of interesting wow this is a did we get to the weekly yet? No, no one why it's interesting. Okay, the weekly chart, one could argue we're in this huge longer term cycle, bear market, bear market, really quick bear market. And you could argue that, hey, we're not in a bear market, we're just pulling back to the longer term moving average. So that's kind of cool to look at that. I would never allow myself to go through that big of a drawdown. And the reason is because as I've said before, if we're looking at something like the TFM 10% system, which I can show you real quick. Oh, we'll be able to get back to this though. Okay, um, I'll pull that up in a second once we get through with it. So George was curious about how weekly would look. Yeah, so the weekly, we just kind of came down here and touched the moving average. And now we have some longer term Landry light working once again. Now, George, I'm glad you brought that up because if we break below this 200 week moving average, that could be certainly where bad things happen. If you go back in time, way back in time, you could probably see, let's see how far back the P's go here. You could probably see some, oh, here's the 40s, okay? So like there's a Great Depression. So you probably would have probably would have crossed back here, putting the average back there. But you can see that this is a this is about an 80 or 90%, I think 95% drawdown from the peak. And once you get below that 200 week moving average and i'm just doing this on the fly that's where bad things could really 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 happen okay let me put uh could you put the 200 day moving average okay i did that okay anything else craig before i shift gear let me just shift gears real quick and let's take a look real quick at the the tfm 10 percent system now the the tfm 10 percent system again weekly charts is going to have you exit a market when you drop below the 50 week moving average and you also drop below the buy line which is landry percent of close and you can see i've got it set for 10 percent or 90 percent of the 50 week close and as i've been saying quite a bit this never changed for a long long time 
because it was going off of this closing high, but then it was this closing high and this closing high. So you can see it has begun to drop. And that's why we came pretty close to a buy signal a couple of weeks ago. Okay, really testing these key levels, the 200 and the Qs. So let's take a look at the QQQ real quick. QQQ. Yeah, Qs are, Qs are a little uglier or, or just as ugly, I should say, as the Ps. So your sell signal and the Qs would have been, wow, look how cool this is. I know I'm a nerd, but look at this. And you probably want to party with me. But look at the sell signal right there in the Qs. That's pretty amazing. I'm 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 amazed with that myself. So you would exit it right here at 350, and your drawdown from that was 35 percent. So you would have avoided a huge drop. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So that's the that's the cues. Let's uh, take a look at the cues. I should have saved the chart. Let me just add in a, a 200 day moving average. Moving average central, simple. And let's go 200 real quick. And we'll take a look at a daily. It's fun doing this stuff on the fly. It really is. I'm such a nerd. Daily. Okay. Daily looks kind of okay. I hate to admit it, you know. <laughs> But the daily looks sort of okay because you could see that we we came down and tagged that 200 and so far we have survived. Here's the other cool thing. Notice that this moving average sort of corresponds with the last breakout. And that's one thing that's kind of cool is that the um the a lot of technicals come together at the same point. AI up big after hours on good earnings. Damn it, I was long that stock today too. See, that's what you're doing. You know, maybe you're missing, maybe I'm missing the forest for the trees, you know? So AI is a stock that's been in the Landry list for quite some time. And like I said earlier, you know, okay, the database is saying AI might be the next big thing. And then maybe it is based on after hour, after hour action. So we'll have to see. Anyway, did I get to everything you want to talk about, Craig, and the and the Q's and the P's and all of the good stuff? Let me just shift back over, finish the market analysis. Oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. No, I, I had I bailed on sound today. Ah. Oh. <laughs> it's see, that's uh okay, Craig. Craig got Craig saw what he wanted to uh, wanted to point out what he wanted to point out. That's good. Yeah, sound was another one that I got knocked out of. And that's what can be frustrating. You know, you do the right thing and then the market takes off without you. We had we just lost money in sound. I love the way this thing bottomed out. It rallied sharply off the lows. We triggered in somewhere around four bucks. It rallied initially, looked pretty damn good, but then unfortunately came right back in. Of course, tonight it's taken off without us. That's a bit of a bummer. All right, uh, we did bonds. Uh, while we're down here, here's retail. You can see retail's kind of rolled back over. It, the bottom line is with all of these markets is they're just kind of wide and loose, okay? Retail kind of looks like a bigger bottom, bigger picture bottom, but it has come all the way back down below its recent little breakout levels, basis the XRT. NASDAQ composite, as you can see, trying to roll back over. I think we talked about this already, but it's a bit of a bummer because it's come back below its last little breakout in here, but longer term, looks like it's still trying to bottom out. The Rusty, as you can see, kind of pulled back in here. Rusty longer term, looks like a big picture bottom, but it is wide and loose and all over the place. Yeah, I think I just got shaken out of sound today. That's a bummer. That was um, licking of the wounds there. Energies have lost steam in here. You can see they're in downtrend profit water. Nothing magical about that, but it is one little trend indicator to look at, but also kind of sideways and, and wide and loose. So kind of hard to get excited about the energies now. Metals have gotten to pop with the dollar, and they've gotten hit with the dollar too. They got to pop. Recently, as the dollar's backed off a little bit, because it takes more and more dollars to buy the metals or commodities, I should say, because the commodities are dollar denominated. But as you can see, trying to rally out of this bigger picture, deep pullback in here, not really seeing anything to get excited about. I don't want to go through too many of these sectors because choppy, choppy, choppy is kind of the, the story of tonight. But you can see drugs have kind of rolled over in here, so that's a bit of a bummer. 
biotech's kind of all over the place now back in downtrend profit water but kind of all over the place i wouldn't trade it or short it just because it's in downtrend profit water but it's kind of all over the place cnh on uup um well a cup and handle i prefer a cup and handles at low levels craig like like way back here or even like way back here as opposed to like within a downtrend like this so a cup and handles a bullish pattern but it's within a kind of within a downtrend so i wouldn't get too excited about that in a dollar just yet so again choppy 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 just throw a dart and i just grab financials i mean financials look okay but they pull back below their breakout level kind of wide and loose and all over the place so that's a reoccurring theme M and C was doing pretty good for a while. And as you can see, kind of hanging in there, but also back below its breakout levels and kind of losing a little steam as of late. So the point I'm trying to get to is we might need to sit on our hands for a little while longer or just slow down putting on the new positions. And it it, it just seems like it's a frustrating type of market. And, and like my wife always tells me, Dave, you're right, but early, is there something you can do about that? And it's like, well, if I could figure that out, not her, but you guys would never see my fast again. And, you know, I'm kind of half kidding about that, but it's like, you know, I was in the hunt on those AI stocks and then looks like they're trying to take off tonight, according to a couple of you guys. So we'll see. But semiconductors still constructive on the semis. The semis is one of the better looking areas. I like for the semis to confirm what I'm seeing in the overall or to help confirm what I'm seeing in the overall market. Right now, the overall market's not fantastic, but the semiconductors are probably the best looking set, uh, sector out there. I don't like I don't like it when the semiconductors are headed lower and the overall market is trying to, to go higher. I like that confirmation with the semis. And uh, as somebody told me years ago, maybe the semis today are more like what the transports were way back in the day when Dow theory was developed. The semis today is kind of like the electronic movement of things as opposed to the physical movement of things. All right, let's hop into some individual issues and then we'll uh any questions you may have dkng i remember liking this one this one looks okay uh it can be a little wide and loose and all over the place bigger picture wise it looks okay it's pretty volatile overall i think it's an okay it doesn't jump out at me as something I have to buy tomorrow. And, and one of you guys accused me of being too selective and I took that as a compliment, um, but it looks okay. It's not a bad looking stock. This would be something that I would possibly, especially with this kind of volume, if this thing got whacked, I would maybe look to play an opening gap reversal, but it would be a, a choppy one. I mean, notice how this thing is just all over the place. So yeah, I'll give you just shy of a high five on that one. If you zoom in, in this rain, this run here, Nice little gap higher, followed by a nice little fairly orderly pullback. Makes it uh, kind of interesting. So, yeah, almost a high five on that one, Jeff. Good eye. George, RxO. All right, let's back her out a little bit. Yeah, this is a, an IPO. It, it's not bad. Uh, you know, it, it had a rough start, but it did break out to brand new highs. The buy at B would have been where on this one? Above this, the buy at B would have been on this day here. And it's pulled back from that. It, it looks okay. It's a little kind of kind of all over the place, but it's not bad. So I'll give you a not bad on that one, George, for sure. Worth a, worth a shot, possibly, yeah. I'd almost like to see a tiny bit more pullback in this one. But yeah, it's not bad. And and as I say often, when an IPO starts making new highs like VTS, we're long VTS. And you can see right at these brand new highs, that's usually a really good thing because everybody's happy in the IPO. Bam, that's Emerald's favorite stock. Yeah, that looks good too. Uh, this is actually in the Landry list tonight. I forgot that it was, so otherwise I wouldn't have mentioned it. But this one's okay. I mean, it's an IPO, it's pulled back, it looks okay. So not bad at all. Um, it's got a little trend pivot pullback action in here and almost like a deeper pullback, but it does look good. And the good thing is if you're playing something like this, it's pretty close to brand new highs and you'll get that that new high boost that we often talk about, kind of that buy a B type of action. So I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a high five on that one or almost a high five. Again, I'm not super excited about a lot of stuff in here. 
Uh, this one's a little wide and loose and all over the place. And you can see it made its brand new high on day one. And then it pretended, and then it pretended, and then it, and then imploded from there. I would hold off on this one. I kind of see what you're seeing though. It, it's worked its way higher. It's pulled back a little bit. It's just this actual longer term isn't fantastic. I would actually let this one make brand new highs and then maybe look to play a pullback. But I'll give you an idea on that one, Brian. I can see where it would catch your eye for sure. Yeah, Lico, Lico is okay. Um, it did kind of make like a double top knockout a bit. You know, my as I've said before, my only concern about uh, an established issue, not an IPO, two different animals. But my only concern is with an established issue, especially with the market kind of iffy like it is, that's just coming off of all time highs, is if the market does kind of kick it into gear, some of these stronger stocks will become a source of funds. Uh, the HV is a little low on this one too. Usually, or at least lately, I haven't gone too far below 30. But it, it looks okay. Uh, it's not, you can certainly do a lot worse, right? Oh, no problem, John. Nope, not, not at all. Okay, so uh, yeah, BTS, yeah, I was kind of bummed out to see that because to me, when a stock gives a dividend, it's like, eh, we, we don't know what to do with our money, so we'll give it back to you. So yeah, BTS has a 50 cent dividend is what he's saying, if we're still long on 314. Yeah, so you're going to see some gyrations that are going to happen, some dividend capture things happening, and and probably uh, people bail on it um, when it goes XD. So yeah, don't get too excited if you're down 50 cents overnight. Um, if you don't mind, uh, put a post out on Facebook when that approaches, and maybe we'll have to adjust the stop a little bit because the stock will drop by the amount of the dividend, and ideally you want to see the stock come back after that happen so you get the dividend and then you get the capital gain type of movement 314 huh mos 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 looks like it's emerging from a base it is it is um it's a little wide and loose hv of 32 a little bit on the low side not too too bad but i would have to see some serious follow through to the upside on this one and then see if it could, it could trade in a more orderly fashion okay i see what you're seeing though nice little breakout but it's a little too wide and loose and then it'd have to trade in an orderly fashion and also it could be one of those stocks where it, it's going to set up way up here toward the old highs and i just would prefer to find something that's kind of a little bit more mid-trend as opposed to going back to its old highs like that so i i, I hear you uh it's just something that i wouldn't get too interested in at least not right away all right uh, any more quiet bunch tonight mostly quiet good stock picks tonight though you know you got i tell you what I, I have to give you kudos because there's not a whole lot of good stocks out there right now and uh, you guys have picked pretty much the best of the best and i probably need to call this down a little further but if you look at my this is my, say I got 65 stocks on my momentum list in here, as you can see. So not a whole lot of stocks. And sometimes this list will be two or 300 that I that I drill down to. Okay, OII. Yeah, OII looked pretty good recently. I think that's oceaneering, huh? These companies come back and forth on the market. OII. It's a little all over the place, but it is an energy stock. And this was on the Landry list. If you go back... Let's see, one, two, if you go back to like right here. So that's that's a pretty decent looking setup. I wasn't super excited about energies at that juncture. It did break out nicely above all this wide loose trading, okay? Like the stock you looked at earlier, you wanna see it break out and ideally push towards highs. But I liked it back then, that's when I put it on the Landry list. And the reason I didn't take it personally, nor did I recommend it was because it was an energy, but dang, BTS is an energy. Yeah, BTS is an energy, but it's also an IPO. So you've got a little bit of that push uh, to ha have it, uh, to help it out. But yeah, super good eye on that one. About a week ago, you'd get a high five for sure. Some of the energy names are getting better. Yeah, there are a few energy names that are improving, but ideally you want to see that energy sector go on and make just some new highs. 
Now, sometimes I call it the meatloaf trade. Two out of three ain't bad. The market's doing well. The sector's doing well. The stock's doing well. Well, right now, the, the stocks can, uh, energies can trade contra or in lieu of stocks. So I don't, I don't worry as much when the market's not doing well. But ideally, even with energy stocks, you want to see the market doing well, the stock doing well, and the sector doing well. But if you really like a setup, then by all means, take it, knowing that you might be wrong. But you have to make that from a psychological standpoint. You have to make that decision and say, okay, I know these things aren't perfect, but I still like the setup enough to take it. I'm going to make that decision, and then I'm going to live with that. And that's the secret to trading. And it's pretty much a secret to life, too. It's like, okay, I, I'm going to decide to buy this boat, knowing that I'm probably going to spend a lot of my weekends working on this boat you know so that's like a life decision or whatever that's not a huge decision but you kind of get the idea it's the living with the decision that's a lot tougher than it's pretty easy to make the decision that's why especially in trading this very little barrier to entry it's really easy to get emotional and click into something without really thinking it through but do think it through and say okay this thing has got persistency it's pulled back fairly deeply sector's not quite there, market's not quite there, but you know what, overall, I like the setup, then go for it, okay? And again, as somebody accused me, and they apologized for criticizing me, but I took it as a compliment, they said, I've been a little too picky over the last year or so, and, and I know I have been, but that's been okay, and it seems like whenever I lose, a, lose on a trade, I'm like, was I picky enough? And it's like, you go through all that, that mental masturbation. All right, any more stocks before I wrap things up? Obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, if you're in Facebook, just bring it up and we'll noodle with it and everybody can participate, obviously, in the uh, in my group. You do have to be a member, by the way, of DaveLander.com. You have to be a gold member, at least, to participate. And I'd love to have you there. We've got a great group of traders, a lot of the guys that are here tonight. Mark and George and John and all these guys and Jeff I'm talking to that, that are bringing up these decent looking stocks, especially given the conditions of the market are there. So uh, I really dig you guys. I really thank you guys for coming and, and uh, really enjoy going back and forth with you guys in the group. We'd love to have some new members, obviously. <laughs> My wife especially would like some new members. So uh, give it a shot. I'd appreciate it. All right. LSCC, last one, and then we'll... Uh, We'll go ahead and wrap things up. LSCC more or less filled the gap. I don't see the gap you're talking about. The only thing I don't like about this one is I don't really like these V-shaped, or I know it's kind of more than a V, but these cup and handles at high levels, like I said earlier, I'd rather see a cup and handle like way down here, way down here maybe, okay, as opposed to these high level for those reasons I gave earlier. But uh, yeah, good eye on that. All right. Thanks, everyone, again, for coming. And uh, see most of you guys and girls, almost everybody here tonight, tomorrow on Facebook, everybody else. If we don't talk to you now and then, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. And may the trend be with you. You're welcome. Oh, I see what you're saying. The gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it had a gap down this morning and then it filled it. I, I got you. All right. Have a good one. Good eye, Brian.